Who misses free and affordable ads and social networks without the anti-sex work rhetoric? Assembly 4 is a team of sex workers and technologists in Melbourne, Australia, aiming to bring back free and fair advertising and social spaces to the sex working community. They also give back to organizations based in harm reduction, sex work, and education. Stepping away from the clunky design of traditional platforms, their two products, Trist.link and Twitter.at are refreshing and well-needed changes in both presentation and mission. Both are free to join and open to all. In the words of an A4 user, from the policies to the language to the advice and tips, it makes such a big difference to feel encouraged and supported instead of policed. Check out their website, assembly4.com, for the word and not the number, for more info. Welcome to the Peep Show podcast. News and stories from the sex industry. With Jesse and PJ Sage. Welcome back to another episode of the Peep Show podcast. This week I have Juniper Fitzgerald with me. We talk about our essays on sex work and motherhood in the New Feminist Press Anthology, We Too, Essays on Sex Work and Survival. Is there enough kink and flirtation in your life right now? Aorta Films creates lusty, opulent, glorious fuckery. Their films are full of beautifully shot, super hot queer porn featuring a large range of bodies, identities, kinks, and dynamics. This month, check out Aorta's newest release, Hard at Work, featuring Indigo and Zay Royale. Working from home has its perks, so when Zay Royale finds Indigo working overtime, they decide to take matters, and Indigo's dick, into their own hands. Shot during the pandemic, this at-home short featuring IRL partners buzzes with electric, intimate energy. $9 a month on Patreon gets you full access to Aorta's library of 60-plus short and featured films with a new film released on the first of each month. Or back them at the $17 a month level and you get a download of that month's film delivered straight to your inbox. Welcome back. Um, I am really excited for today's episode. I have Juniper Fitzgerald on, and we're going to talk about um, our essays that are in We Too, the new anthology that's edited by Tina Horn and Natalie West that came out this week. So that is very exciting. Um, We also talk about motherhood and string theory and the X-Files and Gillian Anderson and stripper poles and all sorts of things. So it's going to be a fun episode. I am a little tired right now because I just put my little boy on a school bus for the first time ever this morning and I couldn't sleep last night. I was like so nervous for him, but he just got like right on the bus. Like it was no big deal. Like he did it every day. So I don't know, maybe I didn't need to stay up all night, but here we are. I can't help myself. Before we get into the episode, I wanted to do a little um, housekeeping. I first wanted to talk about the fact that I so appreciate all of the new patrons this month. We had a really good month on Patreon and it shows that you all are appreciating what we're doing, which I can't even tell you how happy I am about that because we work so hard here to give you guys really good content that we think that you'll like. So having people sign up for Patreon and support us in the ways that you do is really meaningful. I wanted to give a special shout out to the people who are contributing at $50 a month. Um, and there's two of them. There's Frankie Rivers, um, a great content creator that you all should check out. And uh, um, and Aubrey Hayes and Liara Rue, who you should also check out. So we are uh, really super grateful to them and then also to all of the other Patreons who are keeping us going. Um, the po- running a podcast and running our site that we run is a lot of labor. <laughs> um, all of these episodes take a ton of time and energy, a lot of editing skills, um, And not only that, but we also have to like advertise it. Courtney Trouble and our intern Liz do a great job of that. We're spending a lot of time um, recruiting people to be on the podcast, Um, also trying to get sponsors. So like, please, you know, if you can contribute to our Patreon, we really appreciate it and just kind of keeps things running here at Peep Show Podcast because we love what we're doing and we want to continue to do it. So 
huge shout out to Frankie Rivers and to Aubrey Hayes and Liara Rue. We appreciate you very much. I also wanted to talk about a couple of other things coming up. On February 12th, we are going to have our next Peep Show Live, and we have uh, a special Valentine's Day thing. So PJ and I are actually going to be guests. We're not going to be hosts. The hosts are going to be our intern Liz and Courtney Trouble, and they are going to do a great job. And we're going to be talking about couples in the porn industry or in the sex industry. So we have a couple of love. We have three lovely uh, industry couples, and I will announce who they are soon. But it's going to be great. So save the date, February twelfth, eight thirty p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, The last thing that I want to say is that if you haven't already, please uh, buy Feminist Press We Too, Essays in Sex Work and Survival. We're going to be talking a little bit about that today, but it is an amazing compilation of sex work writers. Man, when I got this in the mail and I saw my name among all of these other sex work sex workers that I admire so much. I was like kind of starstruck. I'm not going to lie. Like uh, a lot of people who've been on the show actually are in the book, but so many other people, um, Ashley Page, Laura Lee, Thought Scholar, uh, Femi Babylon. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, Juniper, obviously. Um, Arabelle Raphael, Maggie McMuffin, Reese Piper, just Audacia Ray, on and on and on, like really, really amazing writers. So you should check that out. If I were you, I would buy it directly from Feminist Press. Other than that, I don't have any announcements right now. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hey, I'm Adrian, one of the hosts of After Adult Podcast. My porn name should be Mozart Fremont, but you probably know me better by my actual porn name, Siri. I'm Rachel, but my porn name would be Woody 16th Avenue. (laughs) <laughs> After Adult is a podcast about life and porn. I don't actually watch porn. <laughs> I don't really watch that much porn either. I probably watch more than you, but I mean, most of the time it kind of would feel like going to work on my day off. You 100% watch more than me because I don't watch <laughs> porn. Find us wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for After Adult. Or visit AfterAdult.com and follow us on Instagram at After Adult. I'm here with Juniper Fitzgerald, who is a mama, writer, and radical in the Midwest. She's the author of the first children's book featuring a sex-working mother, How Mamas Love Their Babies, as well as the forthcoming auto theory on sex work, motherhood, and narrative. So welcome, Juniper. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you again. It's been a while. It has been a long time. And it's so funny when you read my bio, I guess I'm like, I hope I'm a radical anyway. (laughs) (laughs) I I, I'm pretty. True. I'm pretty sure you are. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. We get like, well, you know, the fact that none of us have left our house in like a year makes us wonder about that. I know, totally. I don't know what's real anymore. I know. My son was talking to me about that yesterday, and I was like, I don't know. I used to think there was like a world outside of our house and family, and now, you know, I, I I'm not so sure. <laughs> I know. My child, so she's been getting into um, like string theory. Really? I know. Isn't that wild? So she's obsessed with this idea that that there are multiple timelines and Mm -hmm. that in one timeline, she's the mom and she makes the rules. (laughs) Oh, how convenient. (laughs) (laughs) That's interesting. How'd she get into that? Um. You know, this precocious kid, most of the time I look at her and I'm like, how did you come from my body? I don't understand. (laughs) Like, I'm pretty sure by the time I was six years old, I was smoking cigarettes and drinking whiskey. Um, But (laughs) Probably not six. I don't know. I don't know. But um, she like found this video um, on this physicist or like string theorist guy named Brian Green and yeah I know who that is oh do you know who that is yeah yeah I actually wrote a master's thesis on special relativity theory Uh and like yeah Uh I don't I'm not a science person I don't really know why I did that I was doing a theology degree and I got obsessed with this idea of whether like if there was a God, if God could be inside of time or outside of time and what that would mean. So I spent like a couple of years of my life looking at different models of time. (laughs) That is fucking amazing. And do you know what else I love about this? 
So Scully in the X-Files, her PhD dissertation is on relativity. And my next book that's coming out is basically all about the X-Files. Really? Yes. I remember talking about the X-Files with you, but I did not know that that's what her dissertation was on. Yes. You're like Scully. <laughs> well, I'll take that as a compliment because she's kind of an icon. <laughs> um, yeah. She's the hottest thing that's ever lived, actually. <laughs> you know, I've never watched the X-Files. I mean, you know, watching it now as an almost 40-year-old self-proclaimed radical, I'm like, oh, wow, this is a story about cops. But yeah, uh, so that's, you know, yeah, <laughs> that's not good. But, um, I, you know, just thinking about the 90s, I don't know if you had the opportunity to watch Promising Young Woman. Um, no. Oh, my God. So, I see people tweet about it all the time, though. Is it worth watching? I really, really loved it. And um, the set director, whatever you call them, for Promising Young Woman was the same person who did the set design for um, Sweet Valley High. And, oh, interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, it's supposed to be kind of this radical critique of um, <clears throat> like 90s, you know, the the kind of promises of, of girl power and shit like that of the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what I think of when I think of Scully and the X-Files. Like we had never seen anything like Scully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, in the 90s. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be critiquing it now because that show was sure. super problematic. Yeah. You know, I had my, <laughs> this is going to sound like a weird thing to say, but um, we watched uh, Dirty Dancing the other day because my kid and my husband were like, I've never seen Dirty Dancing. And I'm like, what? How can that be? <laughs> How have you guys never seen this movie? Because I swear my little sister and I watched it, you know, I mean, I was born in the 70s. So I grew up in the 80s and we watched it like a bajillion times when we were growing up and like yeah. thought it was so, uh, you know, scandalous and interesting. And I like to watch the dancing. So I was like, well, you guys are going to watch this with me. And we watched it. And I was thinking about the fact that like, Sometimes things that are like that we remember don't, I don't know. I could tell that my kid was like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> like, I think he read it as like cheesy, where to me it seemed like radical when I watched it. Oh, totally. I mean, that's kind of the the promise of nostalgia, right? And like how mm -hmm. it's always a false promise. Um, and that's, I mean, I'm super interested in these narratives that we tell and how they change over the course of a life. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, it's so interesting to think about whether God exists inside or outside of time, but like how that might parallel questions of narrative. Like what yeah. does it mean to mm -hmm. look back on a narrative you had or look back with nostalgic eyes on something? I think those are really interesting questions because the whole idea of like God standing inside or outside of time is how much can we perceive like at once, right? So yeah. the, whole, the whole idea of like a space time block would be, you know, that it would mean that if you could get outside of it, you could like see the totality of the temporal order, like all at once, you know? And so what would that mean for nostalgia? And like, why is that idea even interesting? You know? Um <laughs> And yeah, and nostalgia, I mean, nostalgia only happens because of our perception of time moving linearly, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. You only have nostalgia because you're looking back. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I've heard people describe that, like, in some places in the universe, there might be time is like more of a physical thing. Like you could yeah. step into the future and then step out of it. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of like theorists who came out of like going back to the special relativity theory who would talk about the fact that like, um, like past, present and future you could think about as like having equal status as like points in uh, this kind of spatiotemporal framework, you know, just as like up and down have points like geographical points like time could also be conceptualized like that. And that's really interesting to me. It's super interesting. And, it, you know, coming out of 2020 and having a shit ton of grief around a mm -hmm. whole lot of things. Yeah. It really makes me think about grief, too. I mean, mm. if the past, present and future are, are kind of just these points, I mean, rather than this linear thing, what, do, right. what does it mean to be grieving in this moment? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but also, like, subjectively, like, you know, things feel different over over time. Things that were, like, very intense at one point in time. And I think, like, we uh, feel this sort of intensity now coming out of this year. Like, at some point, we'll feel like the past. <laughs> you know, I think about this. I think about this a lot with my kids because they're... Um, you know, one's in high school and one's like a young adult and they're experiencing, you know, 2020 at these like really intense moments of their life. Like, you know, 15 and 18 are intense moments of everybody's lives, but their lives are like, particularly impacted in this way that cha- will change a lot of their, I don't know, I think it'll change the course of like how they think about things. And, you know, but at some point they're going to be telling a story about what happened this year. And to people who can't remember it, my little one isn't going to remember this, you know, and it's, that's so weird. Time is a weird thing. I think we've all experienced at least just the weirdness of it. in twenty. <laughs> yeah. Like what day is it? Has it been a year or like <laughs> years? <laughs> Yeah. Or even like, remember that time that we used to, you know, go places and see other people, not just on our computers. It's like a very weird thing. It is so strange. Yeah. And I don't know. It's it's also become like normalized in a way that's also weird. You know, I remember. So right before lockdown, um, we were off, my child and I were off the grid. And, mm-hmm. you know, we were, I was reading these news stories that were coming in and I remember thinking, I wonder when, like, I knew that it was about like shit was about to get real. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, I wonder how long it will take for it to feel normal. Yeah. Was it less than you thought? Um, I guess as a sociologist, it made sense to me, but it is, I mean, it's, um, wild to me as just an individual person, not looking yeah. through my logical lens to see how quickly humans adapt to really fucked up shit. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, that was really quite quick. Yeah. You know what I thought was weird about, I mean, not about the, poli- I mean, and this is political too, but about the pandemic in particular is that, do you remember the like very intense sort of like uh, fear, which was totally rational and reasonable. I'm not saying like you know, that there was in like March and April. And then in like November and December, numbers were even higher and everybody had kind of lost interest in, in it. And like schools were opening back up. It Mm -hmm. humans, I think, forget what a collective kind of species we are, you know, it's like even our mentality or sense about things is collective. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's an interest. That's a good way to put it, I think. Um, Yeah, and we kind of like pick up the pick up the vibe and the energy of the people around us. Yeah, and we're like, oh, nobody's freaking out. May as well open up the schools. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this was like a um, very abstract and heady opening. I love it. <laughs> no, that's what you get when you put us together. <laughs> like, let's try to reconceptualize the notion of time in the I first 10 it. minutes of the show. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so how have you been? I've been okay. I mean, you know, it's been um, a really hard year for all of us. It, um, yeah. In every possible way, it's it's been difficult. Um, mm-hmm. As you know, there was some um, family stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah, my uh, family member um, shot and killed a Black Lives Matter protester. Um, James Skurlock was his name. Yeah. Uh, and so that was very troubling. And um, what what what's the status of that right now? What's happening with your family member? Um. So that particular family member is now deceased. Um, Oh, I don't think I knew that. Yeah. So it's just been a challenge. Yeah. It's wild to be in a city where I like no longer have any family. I mean, it's, you know, being disowned by my family was a long time coming. Yeah. um, But it's wild to be in the same city, especially a small place like where I live. Mm. Um, Are you, do you live in your like where you grew up? 
I do. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know if you were there for a job or if that's where you actually grew up. I grew Yep. I grew up here in a little mid- Midwestern city. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually kind of want to ask you about this because, I mean, we live in the Midwest, too, uh, technically. And I'm curious, like, what you think about um, switching gears to, like, sex work, which we're going to get into, I think. Or what do you notice about the difference between, like, doing sex work activism or writing or uh, stuff like that from a, from the Midwest than one of the coastal cities? Like, do you feel like your experiences are different? I'm, I'm being inarticulate now, but uh, what I mean to say is that like a lot of the um, sex work writing and sex work activism is coming out of like the coastal cities and not the Midwest. But there are like, you know, a handful of us, you know, here. Do you feel like it's a different experience? I love that question. Yeah. I mean, it's totally different. I had this uh, gig through CNN for like a week. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And I wanted to get, um, and it seems, I mean, for anybody watching Peep Show podcasts, this will seem very simplistic, but um, I wanted to get just people, you know, sex workers talking about why sex workers' rights are important to them. Yeah. And this Mm -hmm. random person (laughs) commented on my Twitter, something like yawn, like as if this hasn't been done a million times. And it's like, yeah, I'm on the coast. Wow. You know, yeah. like, talking about sex workers' rights is truly novel in the Midwest. Yeah. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm in progressive um, feminist groups, like private Facebook groups. Mm-hmm. And um, the idea that sex work is something different than sex trafficking truly is a new conversation that's just happening here. Yeah. And, and, and largely due to young people, like young people are so cool. I, I know that's so true. <laughs> are they so awesome? Yeah. So, yeah. I, I think it's way different. I mean, people don't even, I remember growing up here and, and joking that we were 10 years behind everybody else in the United States. And I think that's true of, of sex workers rights too. People are <laughs> yeah. literally just hearing uh, about it. Um, and I hope I'm doing my city justice. I don't, I don't mean to suggest that people are, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, willfully ignorant or anything like mm-hmm. that. It's just that right. the, the circumstances of living in the Midwest do not lend themselves to open conversations about sex at all. First of all, yeah. so, mm-hmm. um, right. sex workers rights is, is is so far beyond just talking about sex. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) I hear that. I even, I mean, I'm from a coast. I'm from the, I'm from California and I moved to Pittsburgh from the Bay area. And, um, I've been here for so long now that I might as well be from the Midwest, but I remember, um, moving here and I wasn't a sex worker at the time, but what I remember so strongly is, um, going to initial job interviews when I first moved here and like thinking, oh, well, I'm here now. I got to find a job. And I remember going to job interviews and having them ask me if I had kids and then telling me, oh, well, this is a very demanding job. Uh, It's not right for a mom. Um, And thinking to myself, like, wait, what? Like, isn't that illegal? They can't ask me that. But having things like that happen over and over again, um, where it was just, I was totally like shell shocked um, that that kind of blatant just uh, discrimination based on gender and motherhood was like still happening. But but yeah, I mean, that's, you know, 15 years ago when I moved here, that's where we were. And so to, you know, to even talk about moms, just any moms having like a job that's a full-time job that requires travel is like, that was a, that was an issue then. And so like to move to sex worker rights, that's, you know, (laughs) way beyond. beyond. And you're in a much more progressive place. Like I am in the heart of the United States surrounded by corn. And um, yeah, but I do think that I mean, I remember being part of, and still am part of the queer rights movement in the, you know, begin. I mean, I think my first gay pride parade is what we used to call them anyway. Um, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Late eighties or early nineties. And um, I mean, I feel like that movement is following a very similar trajectory as the sex rights movement. And even some of the same discourse that's been used to, kind of invalidate the queer rights movement is being used against the sex workers right movement now. And I find that terribly interesting. Like these kind of clay, like these really 
like vile and boisterous claims of like pedophilia and shit like that. I mean, yeah. I heard there, um, people saying the same thing about queer people. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. In the early mm-hmm. 90s. So, and, and that's not to say that sexual abuse, like I am definitely not one of those sex worker activists that um, denies that trafficking exists. I, I yeah, definitely acknowledge not either. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exists. So I don't want to discount the fact that like pedophilia and trafficking happen in every place in the world, in every labor sector, et cetera. Um, right. So I don't want to like downplay the uh, the horror of that. But the discourse that sex work activi- activists are somehow apologizing for pedophiles, it's the same discourse that was used for the queer rights movement that people who wanted queer right. rights were apologizing for pedophiles. So it's just really interesting to yeah. mm-hmm. be able to live long enough to see some of this shit recycled. I'm going to try to draw a parallel and maybe it's not really necessarily a parallel, but like I was thinking as you were talking that part of the problem with like the discourse around sex worker rights is that um, sex workers are pushed into having very like or at least into not having super nuanced views about things because um, people outside of the sex work community can't have those conversations and don't have like uh, an ability to do that or vocabulary to do that or like a conceptual framework to understand how like complicated something like sex worker, uh, mm. sex workers experiences are. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I was just thinking as you were saying that like, one of the things that's happened is that most recently with um, the with Visa MasterCard pulling out of Pornhub, you suddenly had so many people within um, like within sex worker communities, particularly performers and porn performers who were suddenly forced to like defend their right to work on Pornhub, which nobody likes, like nobody actually likes working on Pornhub, you know, Um, you know, or likes Pornhub. I mean, some people are making money and, you know, people like making money, but like, um, you know, and I, and the same thing happened with, you know, Backpage suddenly, like you have to defend like really difficult things to, defend because there's like, because it's better than like the, all the alternatives. And I think that, I don't know, I think it becomes, um, I think it becomes really complicated. Well, you know, and as you're saying all of that, it's like, I think that punitive regimes always lend themselves to false binaries because once you've got this punitive regime, that's like destroying the sex worker community and destroying the way that people make money, then, I mean, I, I do not identify as a sex positive feminist, but I can see mm-hmm. why people do. I mean, the, yeah. so the, the the reaction to being systematically destroyed right. um, is mm-hmm. to be like, no, I'm not oppressed. Like I'm liberated. Right. My mm-hmm. work. I love this work. It's sexually liberating, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. Which I think is true for perhaps some people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would say that my experiences are a little more complicated than that. But in mm-hmm. any case, you know, anytime you have like a punitive regime, um, I think it, it lends itself to these kind of um, false dichotomies of liberated and exploited and right. Wrong and, um, yeah. And I mean, I think that's what I was trying to or that's kind of what I was circling around when I was thinking about um, when I was thinking about what you were what you were saying about, you know, somebody saying, oh, we've already had these conversations. These are very basic conversations. And if you're living within a framework, you know, on one of the coasts where you're surrounded by people who can talk, you know, in a nuanced way about sex workers, then maybe those questions do seem, you know, like simple questions that have been happening for a long time. But for a lot of other people, they haven't even been exposed to any of this. So, you know, you have to start somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking about when um, I gave birth, right after I gave birth, I flew to San Francisco and made a porn. Okay. And um, I remember uh, some of the people that I was making the porn with had already figured out a way for me to be on set, um, but in a space where I could legally still breastfeed my child. Oh, and, wow. Okay. Yeah. Like, that's so, because there are laws around that, but just the fact, like that is a conversation that would never happen in Nebraska. Like yeah. nobody mm-hmm. is thinking 
thinking like, hmm, how do we make sex working mothers more comfortable in this phase of sex work? <laughs> you know, like yeah. we really are at this basic, um, this basic level conversation about the difference right. between sex work and sex trafficking. And mm-hmm. and again, like even to have that conversation, you have to set up this false dichotomy because really I want to talk about the gray areas. Right. How, mm-hmm. how we get to have these gray, nuanced, complicated areas that aren't liberating and aren't exploitative. Right. Um, but you can't even get there before, you know. You have to like people. assert the basic like humanity of sex workers first and get people on that page. And that's actually harder than you would think it is. <laughs> to- yes, totally. <sighs> Like, I would think that would be really easy. But then I saw, I mean, just because I would think it should be easy to assert the humanity of all people and have them be like, yes, they deserve to not be um, hurt in their jobs. They deserve to have a way to, um, (laughs) you know, safely work and live and thrive. Um, That seems like such a basic, like, basic principle to me, but it is just not for so many people. And I I think about that every time, every time I make it like a little bit out of like the sex work bubble, if I happen to tweet something that goes, you know, slightly viral so that people that aren't sex workers see it. Um, and I'm just barraged with like, yeah, but who cares? Like they're whores, you know? And I'm like, wow, you know, we, we assume that people believe that we should be like, treated with some like some amount of empathy but that's not really what's happening there are just so many different ways to um kind of branch off of this conversation but it's you know I I was actually thinking about this last night I I saw some people posting on Facebook where I now live most of my life because I've been on uh lockdown for a year um I saw some people (laughs) I gave up on Facebook. I I quit. (laughs) But so I don't know what's happening there. So you'll have to tell me. (laughs) Well, I saw some local people posting about their affinities for Bernie Sanders. And I so I live in Nebraska and I um, I've been working in or, you know, started working in the service industry here when I was 14. Like I Mm -hmm. know. And so I was just cracking up because some of these people were such horrible customers. Like I have done every possible thing you can imagine in the service (laughs) industry, including (laughs) sex work. Um, Yeah. And like, people are fucking assholes. And Uh so I think that the the kind of lack of empathy for sex workers is at its core, a lack of empathy for laborers and the proletariat. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's very much class-based and and, and obviously intersectional, um, you know, with race and uh, ability and... But I, but in any case, I, I, yeah, I think it's that sex workers are considered kind of the lowest on the rung mm-hmm. of labor. And yeah. they're so far down that it's not even considered labor. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's considered right. like, I don't even know, like an identity to be uh, spat upon. Right, yeah. Yeah, so why... <laughs> <laughs> on that note, <laughs> on that note, let's talk a little bit about the um, the anthology that we both have essays in. So one of the um, reasons that I wanted to talk to you is because we both talked about motherhood and sex work. And um, I was curious if you wanted to talk a little bit about, um, and you're also writing a book uh right now too, that encompasses these themes. If you want to talk a little bit about how you've been thinking about like motherhood and sex work. Oh, yes. I'm so happy to be in an anthology with you. I opened up the table of contents and I was like, holy shit, how am I in a (laughs) book with these evil? I know. I thought that too. I was like, this is like the who's who of like sex workers. How did I end up here? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's it's um, lovely to be in your presence um, and several <laughs> other writers that I just respect. and um, So much. I know. I had that same feeling. Like they did an amazing job of curating such good writing. Totally. So I have to give a shout out to Feminist Press because they are amazing um, and they've always been um, supportive of me. You know, they published mm-hmm. uh, How Mamas Love Their Babies, the children's book with a sex working mother. Yeah. And they're just a wonderful press company. So yeah, check out 
we too buy it right from feminist press. Um, yeah. but the way, yeah. So God, I mean, I've thought so many different ways about motherhood and sex work. Um, <clears throat> and you know, you know what I've actually been thinking about a lot lately, and I, I'm <laughs> going to not dive into my article for we too, too much because I, I actually get really embarrassed looking at old writing. <laughs> I, I totally get that. that problem, but, um, yeah. But I was actually thinking about um, when I first got pregnant and first found out that I was pregnant, I was working with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, it's really dry here and we're in a blizzard. So I keep coughing and you probably you won't are. be able to edit out. But, um, so I, I was working with a brothel Um I had been hired as a worker and then I got pregnant. And so I was doing writing um, and I wasn't selling sex, but I was still like um, working with them pretty regularly with some writing mm-hmm. projects and stuff. And um, the manager of the brothel, I was like, you know, you really should let me work at the brothel because I'd be like your only pregnant lady and um, it could be super hot. <laughs> and he, um, he said, no, I, I could like, I morally couldn't allow that because the only people that would be interested in having sex with a pregnant lady are people who have weird, um, like child fetishes. What? Yeah. Isn't that wild? So yeah, I keep, so I keep coming back. So long story, really long. I keep coming back to, um, I don't know if you've read (laughs) Maggie Nelson's, uh, the Argonauts, but I love that book. It's my my favorite book. (laughs) She's so brilliant. Um, she has this quote that's like, the thing about being pregnant is that you're not one, but you're not two. Mm, And I, mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's kind of like the kind of weird nuance, undescribable thing about sex work too. Like I'm not public, but I'm not private. Like, yeah, like I'm not Mm -hmm. a public woman, but I'm not, a. I don't know. Um, yeah. That's and, really interesting and I think pretty profound. Like how, what what does it mean to occupy like our bodies if we're pregnant or if we're doing sex work or if we use our bodies in ways that um you know aren't deemed uh respectable or appropriate or something. Right. And the way that like this brothel manager viewed me was that I was no longer like an autonomous woman. Mm-hmm. Like I was like the child was the only thing that mattered about my body. Therefore, anybody having sex with me was like ostensibly having sex with a child. Um, that's bizarre. Like, yeah. I I think that's really bizarre. Like, does he think that like couples like just abstain from having <laughs> sex the entire time one of them is pregnant? <laughs> I mean, it's bizarre to us, but I think a lot of people do think that way. You know, yeah. like mm-hmm. that, um, I, I was... I lived in Las Vegas through my pregnancy yeah. and, and I mean, I would still go out like, yeah, like leave <laughs> the house I'm and be a human being, <laughs> to some people. Um, but there was this great casino that had amazing pizza and I would go to this casino and, you know, be my hot pizza. little pregnant self and have yeah. pizza. <laughs> and, and people, you know, people come to Vegas and they don't, they don't even think about the workers. They just think right. that Vegas is like this party town and they, they have no conception of who like keeps the town running. Um, right. But the amount of times that I had people like aggressively chastise me for being out at a casino while pregnant was just incredible. The ironic thing about that is I actually really loved having sex when I was pregnant. <laughs> Oh my God. The orgasms were so amazing. I know they're so good. It's like your whole body orgasms and you're like flooded with hormones and you have like twice as much blood. So yes, <laughs> it's just great. Oh so the fact God. that we desexualize like uh, women when they're like super horny and when sex is really great for them, it's just really a shame. <laughs> Hello, this is Chelsea Poe from TroubleFilms.com. I'm here to tell you about getting access to hot BDSM, queer, trans, and dyke porn all in one place with code 
Peep Show 21, you can get 21% off your next order from TroubleFilms.com. Again, that's code PeepShow21, TroubleFilms.com. I mean, okay, so another parallel that's interesting is like sex while pregnant is obviously not for procreative purposes, just like yeah. money is not. And I think um, a lot of the stigma around mothers and sex work, particularly at the intersection of both, is right. this idea of sex being anything outside of like a heteronormative, cis right. male dominated thing. Like the only reason to have sex when you're pregnant is because you want to. Yeah. <laughs> because it's something you feel like doing because it's pleasurable. I mean, there's lots of reasons to have sex, but I mean, like it strip. You're right. It totally strips away the procreative aspect of it. Yeah. Like the heteronormative uh, imperative of procreation. Right. Yeah. I think that's a really, really interesting point. Yeah. and. You know, I camped when I was pregnant and not not a ton because I also had a job and it's exhausting to have a job and be pregnant. <laughs> but, yeah. um, I, you know, I had a non-camming job, but I did cam when I was pregnant. And that was a really interesting experience because unlike the brothel owner that you were dealing with or manager, whoever it was, um, I found that the customers were like not super like fetishy they were actually like very nostalgic <laughs> like really? I had yeah it was a really interesting experience because so many of the people who would like come into my cam room were would say things like oh you look so pretty oh I remember like lying next to my wife when she was pregnant oh that was such a special time in our life like oh I miss feeling a baby kick like all kinds of things huh. like that that I didn't expect at all that's wild that is yeah. so yeah I thought it was really interesting too we interviewed um I, I can't remember if just I did or if PJ and I did it might have just been me um Maxine Holloway about when she was pregnant about doing sex work and being pregnant and one of the things that she was saying that I thought was interesting is that she would have um both for like uh digital stuff but also with full service stuff that she would have that experience um and then she would also have like people who customers who didn't think that they would ever have kids, like who had decided for some reason they weren't going to have any, that just wanted to feel what it was like to be with somebody with like a pregnant body, but also in this sort of like, oh, I want to experience that and I'm not going to actually experience it in my life. I thought that was really interesting too. Huh. Fascinating. Yeah. She also said she had some young people, like really young, like her demographic skewed much younger when she was pregnant. And suddenly she would have like clients in their like 20s who were just like wanted to be with a pregnant woman. <laughs> God, that is humans are just wild creatures. Um, <laughs> but but none of it was what the person that you were working with was saying. You know, none of it was like, oh, I have some attractive attraction to children or you know it was much more like what is it like to experience you know either like looking back nostalgically at their own experiences you know when they had kids or just wanting to know like what that what a pregnant body is is like and how a pregnant body responds sexually and things like that right I think you know I don't know I maybe our kind of demographic of clientele are a little different I'm I'm yeah little uh rough on the edges and my <laughs> clients, um, but I you know another thing that was interesting was I when I moved back to Nebraska from Nevada um and had my baby and was breastfeeding I was trying to sell my breast milk like as a fetish and that's this is when Craigslist um mm -hmm. had been shut down and um where you could still sell shit uh mm -hmm. erotic shit on Craigslist and um, what I found fascinating was that there was like somebody in Nebraska spent who spent it had to have been every waking moment of their fucking lives looking on Craigslist for inappropriate stuff because it was like as soon as I made my ad as a like for breast milk as a fetish, it was flagged within five minutes. Like somebody. Oh, wow. Ad. It's like, who the fuck is sitting at home scouring Craigslist? 
for breast milk fetish <laughs> just to report it. Like, fuck you, man. Uh, yeah. So did you not, were you not able to do that? I was not. I, um, yeah, I got, my ad got shut down so many times. I did have one, one person, um, who we kind of started, uh, my partner at the time and I started a kind of relationship with and things got a little weird. I, you know, <laughs> we could, we could use Foucault to try to understand the Midwest's repression of sexuality and yeah. how that leads to like an obsession. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I, uh, I never found a client. Uh, I think that the brothel situation probably would have felt the best to me to, to be yeah. honest. Um, mm-hmm. But after moving back to the Midwest, um, the the only people that I could find that were interested in this kind of um, commodification of my pregnant body and then the commodification of my breast milk, they actually kind, kind of scared me. Um, there really? Was That's guy, interesting. Yeah. There was one guy who wanted a pregnant, he wanted me to like be a sub, which is not inherently scary, obviously. Yeah. I've, I've mm-hmm. done sub work before, but um, the way that it he, totally depends on what they want and what they yeah. mean by that though. Well, right. And this was all like, I'm going to dictate when you feed your baby. And if I want access to your breast milk, like it was just, it was wow. a whole new world. Cause that's not even about you. That's also, yeah. they want to sub your baby and that's weird. Yeah. yeah. But I, yeah. Again, I think that's demographic. Like, I think that that is the result of Nebraska. <laughs> you know, it's the <laughs> result of like when you're so, when you're in such a repressed place, yeah, and I think this is true of criminalization. Like when you criminalize yeah. and repress, it's always going to be the. I'm sorry, this is probably not politically correct, but it's always going to be the fucking weirdos that are the ones able to rear their ugly heads. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. um, and and no, you're not going to dictate whether or not I breastfeed my child. Thank you. No, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> not. But anyway, wow. I guess that yeah. was. I, I'm, yeah. I mean, I think it's so, this is why I love talking to, you know, sex workers, because I think it's really interesting because it is like so varied and people have like such different types of experiences based on where they are and how people perceive them and so, so many different things, age and race and class. And you, you can't talk about sex work as if it is like, an experience. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, thinking about this one guy who wanted to dictate when I breastfed my own child, like clearly he's an asshole. And I, right. I think that people will hear that story and be like, oh, you know, at least some people where I live anyway would hear that story mm-hmm. and be like, well, see, that's why the sex industry needs to be criminalized. And I, I just don't understand that perspective at all. Like, no. clearly, like this story to me is clearly an example of why sex workers need rights. Right. Yeah. Or why you should be able to put it out on Craigslist, because then you can sift through and see, like, I don't want to work with that guy. I want to work with somebody who instead is just interested in, uh, you know, something else that's not controlling my baby's food intake. And I and obviously there's privilege with being able to choose one's clients. And stuff. yeah, um, mm-hmm. but, I, but I think that at the end of the day, the kind of gray area to kind of come full circle, but this gray area of like, I've had clients that suck. I still deserve rights. Yeah. Right. Why Mm -hmm. is sex work the only job on the fucking planet where you have to first be liberated in order to be deserving of labor rights? Like that is so (laughs) backwards. Yeah. No, it's completely backwards. Yeah. And there is a lot of privilege with that, but I also with being able to choose, like being able to uh, choose which clients you want to work with. But I also think that the fact that, um, you know, criminalization and stigmatization makes it so difficult to even advertise your services, like just contributes to that problem. Oh, total. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. All of this stuff is like very complicated. So that's like a lot of what you're talking about is about much more like the the early stages or being pregnant or having a baby. Like, how do you feel like being, you know, a mother like year after year, like impacts your feelings about like sex work or the way in which like, I, I don't even know, actually, I'm just kind of curious, like in a very open way, like 
how you how you're thinking about motherhood now that you have an older kid? Yeah, that's such a great question. And I know that you have older kids too. So I love talking to you about this. But Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it is it is wild. It's Mm -hmm. at times I have a pole. We have a very small house and I have a pole in my house. I oh, do you? Uh, yeah. I, you know, <laughs> did, you, I, did you used to dance? Oh yeah. I was a dancer, uh, a stripper before anything. Okay. Um, that was your first sex work job. That was my first sex okay. work Okay. I read yeah. that now that I read, I forgot that. Yeah. And, um, actually in the town where I now live is where I started, but, oh. um, you know, I, I, I've made content, uh, with this pole, but just, uh, you know, I mean, I, I like pole dancing um, so I have this pole and I'm not very good at pole dancing. I just like it. And it's good exercise. Yeah. And my, you know, since quarantine began, it's like, what the hell do I do with my child all day? And right. she, um, she enjoys this pole and that's like a really complicated thing for me. You yeah. know, like mm-hmm. I'll say things to her, like, you know, I used to dance on this pole as a job and she's like, yeah, whatever. Like she doesn't care at all. Yeah, and, right. and I try, and I feel like this like overwhelming need to desexualize the pole, like, oh, isn't this fun? It's like, um, a fireman pole, you know? Yeah. Like, or like, like the, like gymnastics bar or something. Yeah. yeah. Whereas, and here, this speaks to the whole class issue um, at hand as well. Like women who do pole dancing for fitness, right? Mm-hmm. right? Like, like they would never have the shame and stigma that comes along with being a, you know, former stripper, right. former mm-hmm. sport, somebody who still slings nudes occasionally. And, you know, <laughs> like they, yeah. they, they would have, they have, none of that baggage, um, right. with them. So I think that the baggage that I carry, which obviously is like internalized whore phobia and stuff, but it's real. I mean, internalized whore phobia is the, the product of being fucked over so many times for right. having mm-hmm. the audacity to survive. Right. So, um, I struggle in my motherhood with that, but I, I try mm-hmm. not to let her see that because I, I never want her to th- think that I am ashamed. I'm not ashamed. I have baggage. I'm not ashamed though. Mm -hmm. I think that's hard because as they're like, as they get older, their questions become like more complicated too. I was talking to Jet Setting Jasmine and King Noir, who are parents like on the podcast recently. And we were talking about questions like our kids ask. And I was telling them that one time recently, like my middle kid was like, we, we were talking about the fact that I told them that I was doing sex work and like different examples of like what that, what that is not, not in a explicit way, but you know, like in a, I do this kind of work, blah, blah, blah. And um, then he brings up, he's like, Oh yeah. I remember when you told me that like several years ago and I wondered like, so when you do, and he was talking about phone sex, like in particular at this point, he was like, when you do phone sex, does that mean that you like open the receiver and then like you and PJ have sex and they let you listen? And I'm like, what? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I didn't say it like that, but I was like, Oh my God, like, no, I don't want to have this conversation. (laughs) Cause (laughs) that's a little too specific. And like, and it's not, I mean, and that's usually not what that looks like too, but like, even if it was like, there's something suddenly about like, do I actually talk about what this looks like or speak about it in like totally vague generalities? And it's hard to like make those choices, I think. It is. And it's not just like having the sex talk, like other parents have like no. my, my child the other day um, picked up a, one of my mentors books. Um, I went to grad school in Las Vegas and um, my mentor, Barb Brents wrote a book mm-hmm. called sex for sale. And so my kid the other day pulls this book off the shelf and she goes, mom, what is sex for sale? <laughs> <laughs> like, wow, that's a yeah. loaded question. Um, yeah. But it's like, well, you know what sex is, right? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, it's when people exchange that for something that something else that they need. And yeah, I think, you know, she's 
six. So your, your kiddo's much older. Um, yeah. And like you said, those conversations become more complicated, but at, at some level, you know, I guess part of me is like, yeah, parents have sex. Right. You know? mm-hmm. And the, the reasons why we have sex are going to be different and contextual and, um, right. but it's, I remember awful. being young though. I, I, I totally remember sex not making any sense to me and like being told mechanically like how you do it and having it not occur to me until much later that like that was something that people also did because it was like fun or they got something else out of it. So it's hard for me to imagine that like that would have made sense to me. But maybe it's also because I grew up in a different, like I didn't have parents who were sex workers. So like the conversations around sex also looked like very different. So I don't know. It's like, I you have to think about like, what can they understand? Right. Yeah. I mean, a, a gr- I think our children are growing up in much different households than yeah. they did. Mm-hmm. I remember I got caught giving a blow job when Bill Clinton was president and my mom <laughs> threw a stack of dishes at me and asked me who I thought I, who do you think you are? Bill Clinton. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. We were talking about Bill Clinton the other day because we were talking about Trump's impeachment and uh, our son was like asking us what um, impeachment means and like how that works and like why we're impeaching a president that's already not president anymore. So we're like trying to like explain this. And um, then I was like, you know, um, it's weird to think that like the, you know, the last time we did this, it was for a blow job. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, what? I mean, not, I mean, there, Trump was obviously already impeached before this impeachment, but like, you know, um, to try to explain to him that, and he was like, wait, but, but what? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But I was in high school when that happened and that was a big deal. Then everybody was like in a moral panic. And I know technically it's because he lied, but he lied about a (laughs) blowjob, which isn't anyone's business. <laughs> yeah. I do enjoy reading Monica Lewinsky's writing these days. I mean, she's um pretty interesting. She yeah. talks about the sexism inherent and how all of that shit went down and Yeah. Can you imagine being her? She was so young when all of that happened. So young. Yeah, she's funny on Twitter too. She is. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, so that brings up, I mean, that brings up a lot of questions about consent and generation mm-hmm. and exploitation. I mean, again, looking. Absolutely. Yeah. Back yeah. On, I wasn't meaning to make light of like a uh, president, like. Oh, um, no, 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 I know. Yeah. For sure. But like, just the, like to isolate the act of a blow, like the fact that a blow yeah. job. Is like, yeah. Um, but then we could drive into the complexity of Monica Lewinsky and her age and stuff. But uh, right. I mean, everything is complicated. And, you know, I think when I first started doing sex work, I remember this kind of compulsion to um, identify as liberated. Mm -hmm. And to some degree, I think, uh, you know, I was pushing back on people who insisted that I was uh, being exploited. I was actually looking at an old journal the other day. And mm-hmm. apparently I was like dating this guy at the time when the time that I first sold sex. Um, mm-hmm. And he, he was, I don't remember this at all, but he was apparently a women's studies major. So <laughs> a male feminist. Uh-huh. And apparently he broke up with me after he found out that I had sold sex to um a wow. at the strip club and his reason was because he didn't want he he couldn't live in a world where women sold sex and what <laughs> <laughs> so mm, i mean interesting <laughs> i think like when i first started doing sex work my compulsion was to vehemently resist that yeah, like yeah I mean, it makes sense because, I mean, going back to what we were talking about earlier, we get, like, pushed into defending things that, like, we don't even necessarily want to defend. But, like, there's such a reaction on the other side of it that it becomes 
I don't know. I think it just yeah. becomes the better option. <laughs> totally. And, but I think, so it's just interesting to think back on, like, I definitely would not describe experiences that I described as liberatory then I would not describe as liberatory now. Mm-hmm. And I, and I think that some of the the things that made my labor difficult were because I didn't have like this basic foundation and this basic like language for talking about consent. And yeah. I learned mm-hmm. that. I mean, you have to learn quick in the sex industry and you learn yeah. quick how to have those conversations. Um, mm-hmm. but, so I think that any kind of exploitation that happens in the sex industry is such a complicated web of social class, race, all of these intersectional identities, of course, right. mm-hmm. but also it's related to this larger issue of like not allowing people language and narrative to describe what consent means for them. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Restricting them from that language so that they right. don't know what consent means for their own self and their own body. Right. Yeah. And so they they also don't have necessarily like you know, a power analysis to be able to break down, like consent isn't just being like forced to do something. It's having, it's also have like, it's also wrapped up in like the sort of choices that we, we have or don't have (laughs) what other options, you know, are available, how we weigh out very complicated conflicts, you know, how we weigh out the, the sort of things that we're trying to balance in our, in our lives and what forces are at work there. And knowing the out, like knowing the outcome, you know, I, yeah. I think about this peep show that I worked at uh, in Arizona. And I don't know if you had this experience when you first started doing sex work, but like when I first started, I would, I would do things without discussing prices. Cause I thought that was rude. So I would just like, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. so I, I remember working at this peep show and um, letting this fucking guy jerk off, like you weren't supposed to jerk off like right in front of the performer, <laughs> but I let him do it. Cause I was like, Oh, he's clearly gonna come yeah. mm-hmm. extra for yeah. this, which he fucking of course did not. Right. Um, and so again, like consent can like conversations about consent can also include conversations about compensation. And right. I mm-hmm. think that, that is the part that makes a lot of self-proclaimed feminists uncomfortable because consent is supposed to always be something that happens outside of commodification, which is just fucking bullshit. It's so stupid. Yeah. The only people that feel that way are people who already have money. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I I totally agree with you. I also think that, I don't know, the, the way I do business now in sex work is so different than the way that I used to do it when I was afraid to talk about prices, when I did think that when I didn't understand that people who will like suck all of your energy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you should get rid of uh, because other people will be around, you know, <laughs> there was so many things that like I did out of like fear or nervousness that like six years into this, I like don't don't do anymore. <laughs> totally. But you have to learn that. You just have to learn it. It's not something that's intuitive and it's not something that's taught in our culture. I think being a menopausal person, like being in a menopausal body is interesting too. I just, I, it, I think menopause is a superpower. It's a struggle for sure, but it, mm-hmm. I just give no fucks anymore. Like I am not here <laughs> for anybody's bullshit. Not that I ever gave any fucks before, but I really yeah. Don't. Mm -hmm. Give any bucks now, and men in particular, you know, cis men. I am just like, listen, (laughs) I I will not give you one iota of my energy for free because you do not deserve it. (laughs) Yeah, and I, you know, I'm not. I don't. I don't actually know. I don't think I'm in a menopausal body. I don't know because I have an IUD that like made my periods go away four years ago. But like, I, you know, I. I don't have that, but I do have after, you know, spending lots and lots of time like uh, in the sex industry and talking to a bajillion like men and recognizing all of these patterns. Like, I just don't like care the way that I used to if they like me or not. (laughs) Right. No, I think there was like and I think girls and women in particular like are trained 
you know, to care if everybody likes them. And that sort of um, coming to terms with your own, like, worth, (laughs) there is something I think that's, I don't know if I would use the word liberatory, but there is something that's powerful. I I would say that there is something that's like powerful about about that. Oh, totally. I like that word better for sure. Powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. To just like figure out that what it is that you have to offer and knowing that knowing what it's knowing what it's worth and knowing what's not worth your time and energy and definitely especially because in the sex industry the people who spend the most amount of money the quick the quickest are also usually the ones that cause the most amount of problems (laughs) i think that cis men also need to interrogate i remember this guy on twitter said something like um he said that I was a lesbian because no men want to fuck me. And it just struck me. What? I mean, clearly that's funny because it's like, no, I'm a lesbian because I don't want to fuck you. But I, <laughs> um, but the idea, like in his mind, the idea that having sex with him would be something that I would be like dying to experience is yeah. so funny to me. Like you literally think that the, epitome of joy for me is to have sex with you (laughs) it's just so funny well it's also funny that he would assume that like there aren't men who want to have sex with you that's also bizarre I know right there's tons of men that want to have sex with me of course there are (laughs) I probably shouldn't be critiquing the whole of our society based on like twitter comments but it's funny (laughs) anyway (laughs) Oh, yeah. I say, you know, a final interesting piece of all of this, um, being <clears throat> an outspoken person, we kind of talked about at the beginning of the show with my family, and um, I've been uh, very publicly supportive of Black Lives Matter mm-hmm. and decrying the um, racism and white supremacy of my family. And in many of the messages that I've received from my now disowned family, um, yeah. The word whore is used like as a Wow, an that's really interesting. And yeah. It's just so fascinating to me that whore is like, I mean, I have a scar like a legit scarlet letter, <laughs> but also whore as like narrative and rhetoric is a stand-in for all non-normative femininity. Right. And yeah. mm-hmm. when you live in a white supremacy, part of part of a non-normative femininity is to decry white supremacy as a white yeah. woman. Mm-hmm. And um, so that I just found that rather fascinating as well. It is, I think that and to and to assume that that's a bigger problem than white supremacy I, <laughs> it yeah. is I also that. like mind boggling to me. But that I mean, so I don't know if you know Brittany Cooper's work. Um, she's one of my faves, but she had, mm-hmm. uh, do you remember when that, this was years ago, there was like a pool party and that young woman was like pulled to the ground by a cop in a bathing suit. And, he, and Brittany Cooper wrote about it. And I love this piece. Um, I can't remember the title, but I, I can send it to you if you're interested. But anyway, Brittany Cooper wrote um, in this piece talking about this uh this pool party um, with this young black woman who got thrown on the ground by this white cop. Uh, Mm -hmm. Brittany Cooper wrote the, um, uh, the protection of white womanhood animates the core of so much aggression against black bodies because it was white women at this pool called the Mm -hmm. cops. And, and that, I mean, that will stick with me till the end of my time on this. Right. Yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. the, the prote- and I think that that is at the co- the heart of of a lot of anti sex work sentiment is yeah mm-hmm. the preservation of white supremacist ideas of what femininity is and should be yeah mm-hmm. and and I think you know the interesting thing about this is that all of this all of this uptick in in concern about trafficking is also like underwritten by this um this like intense desire to protect white women and i think that the like inherent like racism of that needs to be pulled out oh totally absolutely 
It's really sick, you know, and I, yeah, it really is. One thing as a sociologist that I really try to stress to my students is like social processes are not, we're not conscious of how right. all the time, you know, like mm-hmm. I use the idea of a stop sign, you know, you, you know what a stop sign is, but you cannot pinpoint the moment that you learned what it was because it's right. mm-hmm. always been this social construct that has always been present in your life. Right. Mm hmm. Um, yeah. And the same is true for ideologies of femininity and white supremacist ideologies, particularly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't we don't do these things consciously all the time. They're so embedded right. in society. Which, as a white woman, I'm, you know, I'm not the person to speak to this. But um, mm-hmm. there you have it. Yeah. Um, no, but I think I think it is important to to talk about that, and I think it is important to like talk about. Uh, these these assumptions that we have about sex workers, the assumptions that we have about what trafficking is and who's trafficked or who's exploited and these jobs and who's not. Um, I, I think that looking at like where those ideas came from and like calling them out for being um, for being like embedded in white supremacy, I think that's really it's really important. Totally. And we saw the same thing happening at the turn of the century in London. You know, there was like Mm -hmm. this influx of Eastern European migrants and um, racist white people lost their shit and um, Mm -hmm. started these kind of yellow journalistic accounts of young white girls being sold into white slavery. Right, right. Right. Yeah. Well, we should probably wrap up. Do you want to say anything else about like... Uh, the work that you're doing with Feminist Press or your your book that's coming out? Uh, sure. I will just say, um, if Jillian Anderson is listening to Peep Show Podcast, <laughs> I would like her to know that I am in love with her. And <laughs> it's an open relationship. I am here. Call me. Um, and- Did you watch her in sex education? Yes. What? Oh, my God. She's so hot. <laughs> Oh my god. She's oh. also like the hot mom who asserts her own like sexuality in that show. Yeah, totally. Oh my god, see Jillian, I'm telling you. <laughs> we've got something here. <laughs> you never know. You never know. <laughs> I know, I know. So, um I'm hoping that the new book which is basically all about the X-Files and Jillian Anderson and um, sex work will be out in 2022. And I just really appreciate being in this anthology with you um, and all of the other amazing people that were part of this book. Uh, I just feel really grateful. So, and also grateful to be on Peep Show. <laughs> Thank you. I feel grateful to have, you know, to be able to talk, chat with you again. I need a new coffee mug, by the way. Oh, I'll send you one. Will you? Yeah, I will. I used mine so much I broke it. (laughs) I'll send you another one. (laughs) Yay, thank you. Yeah, it was really great to talk to you. Where can people find your your work? Um, So great to talk to you, too. Um, I am on Twitter at um, at Juniper Fitz. And I've got um, publications on... Uh, Vice and Broadly and Pacific Standard and Yahoo News and uh, this new anthology of We Too, um, the children's book, How Mamas Love Their Babies. You should check that out. And- I loved that. I I um, taught it to one of my classes I taught when I was still oh, teaching okay. classes and they loved it. They all bought it and they brought it to class and we did like a story hour. It was very cool. Oh my God. Thank you so much. Did I never tell you that? I don't think so. I love that. Oh, yeah. No, it was really great. And they pointed out so many things about the book. The book was really powerful to them. Oh, that warms my heart. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for chatting with me. Thank you for having me. (laughs) 
Thank you for joining us for yet another episode of the Peep Show Podcast. I'm PJ Sage, and you can find me on Twitter at PJ Sage. And I'm Jesse Sage, and you can find me on Twitter at sapiotextual or at jessiesage.com. We would like to remind you that we have a Patreon account and would appreciate your support. Please visit patreon.com slash peepshowpodcast. Our music is courtesy of Joe Kennedy. The show was produced by Jesse and PJ Sage. Signing off. Have a great week. Thank you.